how are you doing today? We are going to be doing it in the car because we have had several blackouts and our electricity is not on. So we're in the car where it's warm. And I hope you guys enjoy the video. We're going to be doing the Bible. Then we're going to be doing Twice Freed. Oh. oh. Sorry. It switched around. Why did it do that? Woo, I don't know. There we go. Yeah, blackout. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, we... Kimmy, we look up. To, well, we are going... Let um, me start over. I'm sharing the thing. We are oh, going okay. to be reading the Bible. <laughs> then we are going to be doing the synopsis with Kimberly. Then we are going to be doing twice read with my dad. <laughs> the power of uh, Redbox. Daniel, what are you doing? Oh, he's trying to look for a movie to watch. No, I'm looking, looking at the movie. At... Alrighty, who's watching? I see Kimberly. I see. Jessica. Is that Jessica? Hi, Hi Jessica. Jessica. Hi, Jessica. <laughs> it's the apocalypse. Yay. Yeah. We're all going to die. It's the apocalypse day. It's not, not the apocalypse Okay, day. so I wish that I had a place to put this down. You should just put it on, on the uh, windshield, next to the windshield. Like, and then no. It doesn't. <laughs> You'll just have to read. With set it in down hand. anywhere. That's not gonna work. So I'm hearing everything a few seconds before. Well, like after so don't listen happens. to it. Shh. Turn off your headphones. Yeah. We use a doctor. Okay, so we are on. Um, Psalm. Actually, I've got the little marker thing, so why don't I use it? 35. We're going to read. All right. This only works if you're quiet. Okay. Why don't we pass those up? <laughs> Hi. Okay. So, this is Psalm 35 of David. Okay, this is Psalm 35 of David. We might only get through the psalm. We might only get through the psalm. We're only, I was only reading one anyway, because it's kind of long. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. Draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek after my life. Let them be turned back and disappointed who devise evil against me. Let them be like chaff before the wind, with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Let their way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. For without cause they hid their net for me. Without cause they dug a pit for my life. Let destruction come upon him when he does not know it, and let the net that he hid ensnare him. Let him fall into it to his destruction. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exulting in his salvation. All my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him, the poor and needy from him who robs him. Malicious witnesses rise up, they ask me of things that I do not know. They repay me evil for good. My soul is bereft. But I, when they were sick, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with head bowed on my chest. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother, as one who laments his mother. I bowed down in mourning, but at my struck stumbling they rejoiced and gathered they gathered together against me wretches th whom i did not know tore at me without ceasing like profane mockers at a feast they gnash at me with their teeth how long o lord will you look on rescue me from their destruction my precious life from the lions i will thank you in the great congregation in the mighty throng i will praise you 
Let not those rejoice over me who are wrongfully my foes, and let not those wink the eye who hate me without cause, for they do not speak peace, but against those who are quiet in the land they devise words of deceit. They open wide their mouths against me. They say, Aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. You have seen, O Lord, be not silent. O Lord, be not far from me. Awake and rouse yourself for my vindication, for my cause, my God, and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Aha, our heart's desire. Let them not say, We have swallowed him up. Let them be put to shame and disappointed altogether, who rejoice at my calamity. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor, who magnify themselves against me. Let those who delight in my righteousness shout for joy and be glad, and say evermore, Great is the Lord, who delights in the welfare of his servant. Then my tongue shall tell of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. That's the end of Psalm chapter 35. I hope you're enjoying the reading of God's word. And I noticed that Granny Bear is not there. You said that she's at some virtual church meeting. Yes. So she will no, li no doubt likely yes. catch up when she is able. Unlike us, she actually knows which day of the week it is. Because I have no clue. Actually, I do. It's it's, it's Thursday. Wednesday. It's Wednesday. I'm just joking. It's Wednesday. I have to know the day of the week because tomorrow I get to put in a new pair of aligners. Yay! Yay. Mm. We're not sleeping here, by the way. We're just hanging out. We actually watched an episode of uh, Doctor, Doctor Who. Who on our thing. On our on our DVD player. Yeah. Zoom. Hi. Hi. Sorry about that. Okay, so now Kim Kimberly is going to give the synopsis of what happened yesterday. It? Yeah, but be careful because apparently it's really easy to and pause it. And there's a cord. If you can pull the cord. Um, here. We'll change it out with mine. No, it's okay. It doesn't oh, need to be in a cord. This in there. It's okay. Okay. This needs to be plugged in. <laughs> Any second now, I'm gonna be on my phone. Amazing, good team building <laughs> exercises today. Yeah, totally. Okay, you so leftovers on the charcoal grill. No, mom grilled leftovers okay, on the Daniel. charcoal. Go for it. So what happened in the last chapter was they went over to um, the nearby town where Irene. Laodicea. Laodicea. Okay, I need to get to the. You see, I'm gonna get the hang of the names. Right at the end of the book. <laughs> Almost there. So at Laodicea, there was this big earthquake. And um, during the earthquake, during the earthquake, give me a second. Um, they were, they had just finished doing um, a trade for wool. They were like selling the wool and they had just finished doing that with Irene's father. And then the earthquake happened. And Irene's dad was like, oh my gosh, my gold's in this building. I gotta go grab it before it's buried. Mm -hmm. So he goes in there and building collapses. He's dead. <laughs> so Onesimus, he goes over to Irene's house to see if she's okay. And she survived. The ceiling caved in, but that was about it. And, oh, Becca had a test today. And she got a 94. That's great. That's Good job. Not part of the synopsis. I know. But <laughs> so yeah. So what happened was um the, the dad got buried and the and Irene's house caved in, but that was okay. Cuz she, <laughs> oh, she and, was okay. And Rebecca got a 94 on her test. <laughs> <laughs> so he took Irene over to um to a place that was safe. Stop moving. And then and then they, um, he went over to the, the guy who was, who he was with. Glaucus, the Yeah, <laughs> Glaucus, the mean guy. <laughs> and then, um, they were on their way home and Onesimus had this idea. Glaucus, he still had gold in, like, his bag. 
that the master had given him to buy some stuff, I think. No, it was the gold that Polymon had given him oh, for, right. the, for the bale of, of wool. Right, it was the gold that Polymon gave him. So, he goes over and he tells Glaucus that he is going to be taking the gold and he's going to be running away. And Glaucus, he, he, just, he was like, uh, no, that's not going to happen. You're coming home and then, and so Onesimus is like, if I'm coming home, then I'm telling that you stole. And he's like, then Glaucus is like, if you tell that I stole, I'm telling that you stole. And Onesimus is like, you know, I can, I know what's going to happen, and I can live with that. You, you're an old man who's fat and lazy, and you're, on top of that, a Christian, and you're like, you've got this high position. You have a lot to lose, and I have nothing to lose. So, he's gonna, Glaucus is gonna go back, and, um, he's gonna tell everybody that Onesimus, this is, this is how I imagine he'd say it. So, um, Irene's father ran into the building to save his gold, and Onesimus tried to stop him, but, um, before he could get out, the walls caved in and he died. That's how I would say, if I were in his position. Which I'd never get myself into that position. But anyway, that is about it. We're going to see what Onesimus is going to do with his freedom. And here is Dad. Why is it called Yeah, because <clears throat> Onesimus is now free. He can do anything he wants to. He's got his master's money. And I don't see my power cord. Um, good job, Rebecca. Thank you for sharing your test results with us. We are um, in the dark at our house. And the the little lights that we had that were outside on the in the sidewalk... Don't waste that one. Um, we brought them in, so we will have light as long as the solar power lasts for those. Um, um, on the inside, in like the hallway, we zip-tied them to the rail in the stairs and that kind of thing, um, which will help us, hopefully, when we're trying to get settled after, after the um, live stream tonight. But we wanted to go ahead and continue the live stream and now mom is back in the car. So I can hold the phone. <laughs> and she's buckling her seatbelt just in case we leave the driveway. Hey, that's okay. I buckled up too. All right. All right. So I'm going to hand off my phone because I don't have any way to hold it. We used to have a little thing here, but it broke. Like, and we could just hold it like that, but it broke. So... Um, this is what my haircut looks like after not being able to shower for three days. Right, here we go. Hi, so that's not me. That's me. Hi. So we're on chapter 16. Okay, everybody got all their talking off the... Maybe. No, definitely not. All right, now we're done talking. All right, so this is chapter 16. His first thrill of elation was followed by a wave of fear he had never realized till now how much that he had taken for granted had been thrown how much he had taken for granted had been thrown in with his slavery a roof over his head a bed food clothing regular work and he had to admit a kind just master now he had forfeited his right to these things forever from now onward, he must fight for them and earn them or go without. Stop. Is this going to work? I don't really would like this to work. What are you taking from him? Grumpy pants back there. Grumpy, grumpy, grumpy pants. Sorry.
I had the mom for a minute. Da, 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 lost my place. From now onward, he must fight for them and earn them or go without. He was glad he was not alone on the highway. He was just one of a stream of nameless refugees, some of whom purposed to push on to Ephesus or Miletus, while others would seek shelter in the towns and villages along the highway. Some had snatched up a few possessions, and some had empty-handed. Some came empty-handed. No one spoke to anyone else. All had their own griefs and problems, and, shocked and stunned, their one idea was to move on. They knew not where. The sultry day was fading early, and the storm clouds hung low, blotting out the mountains. Very soon darkness would draw a veil over the stricken city, and Onesimus knew that it would be a moonless, starless night, and he was glad of that, too. He must push on as fast as he could, for he did not entirely trust Glaucus. It was just possible that the bailiff, out of spite, would decide to behave like a genuine Christian and confess his sins and those of Onesimus as well. In that case, they would soon be after him on swift horses with hunting dogs, and he would not stand a chance. Tired as he was, he resolved to walk all night and sleep, hidden away in the hills by day. It was an inky night. Only the black shapes of the trees on either side kept his feet on the highway, but he walked on, hungry, weary, and cold, until about four hours after midnight. All the other travelers had fallen behind, and his head was reeling, and his feet were blistered when he realized that something was happening. A cock crowed, some birds twittered, and the cattle in the field stirred in their sleep. A small wind, sweet with the scent of hay, was rustling in the poplars, and now he could see the shapes on the mountain, the shapes of the mountains, black against a clear sky. He scrambled up the bank into a spiny, a spinny of larches, and found a hollow sheltered by some tamarisk bushes. He turned and looked toward Colossae and Laodicea, and saw that the day was breaking behind his, his own mountains and canyons. She would be asleep now in the wattle hut, worn out by her grief, and on the other side of the valley Archippus was probably lying awake, his leg aching as usual, mourning for his slave and his friend. I'm sorry, Archippus, he whispered, and creeping under the tamarisk bushes, fell asleep with a strangely heavy heart. He slept all through the warm summer day and awoke an hour or two before sunset with a raging hunger. It was good to know that he could buy bread. He fingered the packet of gold tucked into his wallet and the small bag of coins soon into his girdle. Something had prompted him to bring it with him when he set out for Laodicea. The highways abounded with robbers, and he must sew the gold into the into his clothing as soon as possible, although his tunic was so plastered with earth and dust that most people would mistake him for a beggar. He traveled twenty-five miles that night, and on the fourth day trudged over the shoulder of Mount, Car Mount Car Caressus and saw the town of Ephesus below, lovely in the evening light. Memories came flocking back, the horror of the temple that nighttime evening when Archippus fell, those strange, unearthly nights when they huddled in Aquila's hut. He wondered where that queer fellow Paul was now, probably murdered long ago. He would have loved to linger, but he dared not. His master had many friends in Ephesus, and he might easily be recognized. He struck straight down to the canal and followed it to the harbor. If, he had, if his luck held, he might get a ship. He would not argue about where it was going as long as he could put the sea between himself and the country of Phrygia, but his longing was to reach the land of his father. Several ships rowed at anchor, and he stood looking westward. Over the edge of the harbor, somewhere beyond the sunset, lay Athens and Parnassus, where the gods dwelt. If he could get to that shrine of beauty and worship there, would he perhaps find what he was seeking? some balm for the sorrows of life, some escape from its sordidness, some philosophy that would lull him rather than challenge him, and cause him to forget rather than stab him to remembrance. Perhaps beauty was the answer. Then he would search for beauty. 
one Mediterranean galley, larger than the rest, had just been loaded, and the sailors were walking away, but a boy of about Onesimus' age lingered, walking the length of the craft and back again, as though examining it closely. He was meticulously dressed in a spotless tunic, and the long, wide-sleeved overcoat of the educated Greek, with a rich ornamented strip of material sewn down each side. His features were pure Greek, and his figure that of a young Spartan athlete. He seemed to Onesimus to embody the land of his fathers, and he watched him, fascinated for a time, then acutely conscious of his own condition. Onesimus dared to ask him whether he knew where to the ship was bound, and when it would sail. The boy looked at him disdainfully. It is bound for Corinth, but stops at Athens, he replied in perfect Greek, and if the wind is favorable, it should sail at dawn tomorrow. He was turning away when Onesimus tried again. I want to travel on her, he said boldly. To whom should I apply? The boy raised his eyebrows. It costs money, you know, he said. Onesimus flushed angrily, and his pride overcame his prudence. I can pay my fare, he replied hotfully. Well, then, perhaps you had better first pay the price of a new tunic, said the boy. This is a first-class ship, and if you do not mind my saying so, you hardly look like a first-class passenger. Onesimus' temper was getting the better of him. I suppose you have hardly heard of the disaster in Laodicea, he retorted sarcastically. Hundreds are dead in the earthquake, and we who fled do not think it worth while to go back and search in the ruins for our banquet clothes. We were thankful to escape with our lives, and extra thankful to escape with something in our wallets. The contempt had passed from the boy's face, and he looked at Onesimus with interest. The captain is already on board, he said in a different tone of voice. Come before dawn and speak with him. Onesimus turned on his heel and followed the harbor wall round to the beaches and plunged into the warm sea. It was nearly dark, and he washed away all the dust and dirt of the past four days, and then tried to do the same for his clothes. He dressed again in soaking garments, and afraid of soiling them by lying down, he wandered about on the beach till after midnight when the summer wind had dried him. He slept for an hour, for a few hours on a slab of marble, and just before dawn he was back on the quay. The sea was still dark, but the sunrise flamed over Mount Caressus, and the quay in front of the galley was a hive of activity, for the wind was favorable. Sailors ran to and fro, ropes creaked, men shouted, and a little a little apart stood the captain, with the young Greek beside him, a well-filled wallet over his shoulder. "'This is the lad I, of whom I spoke,' said the Greek. "'He lost all, or nearly all, in the Laodicean earthquake. So make a merciful bargain with him. He wants to go to Athens.' "'How does he know I want to go to Athens?' thought Onesimus, drawing out the little packet from his belt as the captain named a price." He was relieved that it was no more, and he counted out the coins gratefully. There was still plenty. "'You can go aboard now,' said the captain to on and Onesimus, passed up the gangway on to the galley. He had never before set foot on a ship, and it thrilled him. This was a merchant ship taking the products of Asia to Greece, sandals and woven cloth, cloaks and carpets from Laodicea, Phrygian embroidery, cheese from Bith Bithynia, Figs from the central plains behind Ephesus, goatskins and wool from the Sicilian grasslands, a rich medley of odors heightened by a tang of the sea, rose from the hold. All at once bells started ringing, the sailors ran to hoist a great central sail, and the ship heeled away from the wind and they were off. Onesimus staggered to the side of the ship and saw the bright sea ahead. Phrygia and his slavery lay behind him at last." But not only Phrygia and his slavery, he stood saying an irrevocable goodbye to Philemon, Aptheia, Archippus, little Pescasia, the dogs, his mother's grave, the canyons, the flowered meadows, the flocks of sheep, so much that he had hated and so much too that he had loved. But he did not say goodbye to little Mistress Irene, for he had pledged himself to see her again. His musings were suddenly interrupted by the Greek boy who had come to stand beside him. "'My name is Alpheus,' said the youth. "'I see we are traveling to Athens together. Have you ever been before?' "'Never,' replied Onesimus. "'Are you a Greek?' "'On my father's side.' 
then you are returning to a land of your fathers and to the home of your spirit, if you love beauty and truth. And I see from your face that you love beauty. You must come with me. Nothing could give me greater joy than to initiate a young devotee of beauty. I will stand beside you as we sight the cape and see the white temple of Poseidon, and then we will watch together the flash of Athena's spear above the Acropolis. We will climb the steps of the Parthenon. And how does one earn a living in Athens? Onesimus was half irritated, half fascinated by his companion. Alpheus looked pained as though Onesimus had said something vulgar, and his reply was unsatisfactory. Apparently you did not earn your living in Athens. You were sustained by beauty, and the spirit dominated the body. You talked and worshipped and me meditated. Sometimes you wandered out on the fragrant slopes of Hymettus and lay on the beds of thyme and l tasted the honey that was like nectar of the gods. Onesimus, fast yielding to the fascination, remembered that he still had plenty of gold in his wallet and gave himself up to the spell of the moment, the light roll of the ship, the swelling white sail against the azure sky, the smooth peacock blue of the Aegean Sea, the warm salt breeze, and the pure clear-cut voice of the boy. He was talking of the history of his country now. One evening in the cool, they would walk out together to the plain of Thermopylae. Thermopylae. One day they would rise at dawn and climb the slopes of Mount Parnassus. The magical voice crooned on, telling enchanted tales of enchanted land. Are we good? Yep. Okay. Oh, wrist hurts. Da, 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 da. Enchanted tales of an enchanted land. Stop shaking the car, please. And Onesimus stretched out in the sun and slept peacefully. The enchantment did not break when, on a pale golden evening three days later, the western light gleamed on Athena's spear, and the pillars of the Parthenon against a rosy sky seemed themselves tinged with pink, as though newly alight from heaven. Alpheus stood in the prow of the ship, his beautiful head lifted in silent adoration, tears in his eyes, and Onesimus shared his mood. They watched till the light faded, and as the stars shone out over the sea, the ship cast anchor in the bay of Phaleron. They went ashore early the next morning and set out to walk the five miles inland along the wall of Themistocles, and by the time they reached the city, the heat was blazing. Young Athens... Are we? Where did we, lo where did we leave off? It, it um, disconnected. I don't know. I wasn't listening. Can, I watched it disconnect. But Hey, Jessica, can you tell us where it left off? So that, what was the last thing you remember? I'm really sorry. We lost a little bit of signal. I would just back up to the... I'm going to uh, back up a couple of paragraphs. He was talking uh, of the history of his country now, just so that we have it. One okay. evening in the cool, they would walk out together on the... On, I heard Young Athens. Young Athens. Du, 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 du. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the history of the country. Now, one evening in the cool, they would walk out together to the plain of Thermopylae. One day, they would rise at dawn and climb the slopes of Mount Parnassus. The magical voice crooned on, telling enchanted tales of the enchanted land, and Onesimus stretched out in the sun and slept peacefully. The enchantment did not break when, on a golden, on a pale golden evening three days later, the western light gleamed on Athena's spear, and the pillars of the Parthenon against the rosy sky seemed themselves tinged with pink, as though newly alight from heaven. Alpheus stood in the prow of the ship, his beautiful head lifted in silent adoration, tears in his eyes, and Onesimus shared his mood. They watched till the light faded, and as the stars shone out over the city, the ship cast anchor in the bay of Phaleron. They went ashore early the next morning and set out to walk the five miles inland along the wall of Themistocles, and by the time they reached the city, the heat was blazing. Got a text message. That's fine. Young Athens, there we are. <laughs> 
Young Athens, for the most part, laughed and studied and discussed history and philosophy in the shade of trellised vines and marble pillars. Onismus was grateful to find himself completely undertaken for by Alpheus, who treated him with princely generosity. He produced a clean tunic for him from somewhere and introduced him to a group of his friends. They had all feasted together on bread and goat's cheese and melons and slept in the shade. In the late afternoon, they joined a crowd of disputers in the lovely theater of Dionysius at the foot of the Acropolis. But Alphaeus insisted they should not climb the hill until the evening. When the world is still and the light is mellow, he explained, and the pillars are like warm gold, that is our moment, not in the glare of noonday, but in the mystery of twilight. We will worship our goddess. O oh, Onesimus, have you ever yearned for beauty and peace and truth? Tonight you will be satisfied. It was the time of clear golden light when they finally climbed the steps of the Acropolis and passed through the Propylaea, through the great marble pillars and sea shone like though sorry through the great marble pillars the sea shone like a sheet of silver but inside the great temple of athena it was already shadowy and onesimus keyed up to highest expectation was not disappointed for here was beauty incarnate some quality of perfect simplicity such as dwelt in the soul of the little irene here was no taint of occult evil as the temple of ephesus here he was standing on the very fringes of immortality. As they knelt, worshipping before the mighty statue of Athena, he felt strangely close to the boy at his side, to come together to the source of beauty and wisdom, and to share these emotions was surely the firmest basis for friendship, and from now onward they would be brothers. Life could never be quite the same again. They stayed for a long time beside the statue, the golden light flamed to sunset, lighting up the, go the golds and crimsons of the temple. They wandered all over it and round the precincts, looking up to the shadowed hills and over to the darkening sea. Onesimus' soul, awed by the solemn chanting of the priests and virgins, was drunk with such beauty. But his heart cried out, What's next? Could he carry it with him when he returned to the world below, where men ate and slept and spat and cursed and hated and lied, where slaves groaned and earthquakes destroyed and the innocent suffered? Was there any meeting point? Had any god come down in compassion to men? Had Athena ever stooped to heal and transform with her beauty and her wisdom? He did not know. He must discuss it with Alphaeus. Come, let us drink to the goddess, Alphaeus led him outside, and they sat down on a hillock below the temple. Although Alphaeus had implied that, having seen the temple, they would be in no further need of earthly food, Onesimus was relieved to see that he had brought a full basket of provisions. The warm night was heavy with the scent of thyme and mint, and Alphaeus, his beautiful features clear-cut against the moonlight, filled two cups with wine from a bottle. We will drink and watch the temple washed silver by the huntress Diana, he jested, handing Onesimus a cup, to the goddess. The slave was tired and thirsty. He drank it off in one draught. It was very sweet and strangely strong. Alphaeus, he began, turning to his friend, but Alphaeus sat looking out to see, his wine untouched in his hand. Alphaeus, something was happening. The boy at his side seemed to be receding, and the marble columns away to his right were reeling. He closed his eyes and laid his head on a pillow of wild thyme, and seemed to be sinking down, down into its fragrance. Had the goddess stooped, taken him into her arms? He did not know but he gave himself up to deep sleep. Alphaeus emptied his glass on the ground. He glanced at the sleeping boy contemptuously. Poor fool, he murmured. It had been all too easy. He had a good meal from the basket and then prodded Onesimus with his foot. He did not stir, so there was nothing to wait for. Leaning over, Alphaeus loosened his companion's girdle, slit out the bag of coins and the packet of gold with his knife hid them under the contents of the basket, and bounded off down the hill. Chapter 17. That's awful! Can you finish? 
What? I think, I think JJ's ready for bed. I'm ready for bed too. Daniel says he's ready for bed also. I could do with some sleep. So I think we're going to cut it right there tonight. And I know we only had one chapter, but we wanted to keep up the live stream for um, tonight in spite... Gives us something to do. In spite of <laughs> the crazy that's going on in the world around us. So I hope that you have all enjoyed the reading tonight. I will get it posted on YouTube when I'm able to. Right now, I can't do that because I have to use my computer, and I don't. I could probably have enough power to do that, but I can't log in um, to the internet. Um, we don't have an unlimited amount of um, uh, what's it called? The hotspot. We don't. We don't have unlimited hotspot. So something interesting. This is what it's saying, that's 32. It's saying that the temperature is 32 right now here in Converse, and it's going to freeze, obviously, which I don't doubt, but our car has always been very accurate in measuring the temperature, and it has not budged from 40. Yeah, it still says 40. And from getting in and out of the car a couple of times, it doesn't feel like it's freezing right now. So, wouldn't it be awesome if God just put us in a little bubble of protected warmth? As long as we have power. Power would be good. Power would be a nice asset. Yeah. So, um, there was one other thing that I was going to say, and I can't remember it right now. Sorry. No, it's fine. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah. All right. So, um, after we're done watching... Um, after we're done, wait, stay safe and warm tonight. You too, Jessica. Thank you so much for watching. Um, anyway, we're going to go ahead and go now, and we're going to get these kiddos in bed, and I hope that you all have a good night. God bless you. Some, Yeah, somehow we're going to fall asleep in the dark. That's what Daniel just said. All right, good night. We'll see you later. Bye. Everybody say bye. Bye. Good night. So the thing is, we were watching Doctor Who. So I'm wearing my TARDIS hat, and Mom's wearing her, she's also wearing her Dorf, um, her TARDIS um, jacket, <laughs> so we're matching. Good night. Good night, Becca. Good night.